The future is now in the high-tech Mecca of Raleigh, North Carolina. But when one of the oldest and nastiest forms of assassination rears its ugly head... These are things you just read about in a book. Not something you expect to happen three houses down from you. The past comes back to life with a vengeance. You don't have to be a scientist to realize that life is good in the research triangle. Just ask contractor Michael Mayo and his wife Lynette. I love it here. I, I love the four seasons, especially fall. The Mayos also love their neighbors, biotech researchers and new parents, Anne and Eric Miller. They're the nicest and best couple in the neighborhood. Eric is an age researcher. He was trying to help millions of people. But one Friday, Eric appears to be having a health care crisis of his own. We were just driving out one day and going by the cul-de-sac where he lives, and he was on a cane. And I was thinking, well, that's unusual. Well, something's wrong with, with Eric. Eric's glowing health took a tumble when he landed a nasty case of food poisoning after a night out bowling with friends. But what should have been a short night in the hospital stretches into one long, baffling week. We had not known anything was wrong. Eric seemed to be on the road to recovery, but two weeks later, he suffers a mysterious relapse and is raced to the hospital. And I woke Lynette and I said, Lynette, something's going on at Eric and Ann's house. As Eric's life hangs in the balance, this medical mystery takes an ominous twist. Our communications department received a 911 call from a nurse stating that a patient might have been poisoned with arsenic. Foul play might be involved and thought the police should investigate. Arsenic? Hmm. How did one of the oldest poisons known to man come to this small town? Sounds like a perfect case for the Scribblers. Raleigh's very own mystery writers group. Eric Miller, they said he was poisoned with arsenic. Is and he is a medical researcher. So I, I, I guess yeah. he could have come across it in his lab. If he got careless, who knows? Beakers break, people pick up the wrong compound. I, I know of a case where a woman accidentally put it in the iced tea. Oh, great. And she almost killed her son. Or the other possibility. Arsenic is such an, an old-fashioned murder weapon. Murder? Who said anything about murder? Back at the hospital, Eric is in bad shape and police are scrambling for answers. I came into Mr. Miller's hospital room. He told me he was in a great deal of pain. I asked Mr. Miller if he knew anything about who might have done this to him. But Eric is as baffled as everyone else. He said he had no idea how he got poisoned. And these are the last words Eric speaks to investigators. Within hours, he suffers a massive heart attack and dies with his devastated wife by his side. Across Raleigh, the news spreads like an ill wind. For Eric's college roommate, Tom Boylan, it just doesn't seem possible. The first thing I re remembered about him was seeing his, his big, infectious smile. He you know, was always in a great mood and always very happy. And 30-year-old healthy males don't uh, just kill over and die. They certainly don't. So how did this gentle genius end up suffering such a nasty fate? Ugh, sounds painful. It's not the way I'd want to go out, that's for sure. I mean, how do you even poison someone with arsenic these days? What, do you just buy it in a store? With rumors swirling around Eric's mysterious demise, Raleigh detective Chris Morgan has to quickly bone up on an ancient and vicious killer. Arsenic's a colorless, odorless, tasteless element. If likely, you could eat a teaspoon of it and never even know that you would eat an arsenic. It essentially causes all your internal organs to shut down, so you're experiencing nothing but terrible, terrible pain. As Detective Morgan works day and night, desperately trying to crack this medical mystery, one simple explanation stands out. Eric Miller was a scientist First thing that I assumed was, well, maybe we just got some kind of environmental exposure here. Has Eric fallen victim to the tools of his trade? We went to the lab, searched it thoroughly. We had to determine if there was any environmental explanation for Eric's poisoning. But the hunt for arsenic in Eric's lab comes up empty. The possibility that there had been some environmental exposure to arsenic was essentially eliminated. 
and there's something unusual about the course of Eric's illness that's bothering Detective Morgan. His condition was slowly but surely improving, and then all of a sudden it bottoms out again, which is uncharacteristic of arsenic poison. This deadly mystery is getting more thrilling than even the Scribbler's favorite novels. Coming up, investigators are forced to consider a possibility so horrifying. You don't suppose it was a suicide attempt, do you? It will shake the research triangle to its core. mystery is afoot in Raleigh, North Carolina. And the ladies at Dinner Savvy just can't get over the toxic shock of Eric's death. Well, they thought it was a bug. He had a virus or something at first, right? That's what I heard. Can you imagine how much he suffered? Accidental ingestion has been ruled out. Investigators now hope a look through the pages of local history might uncover some further clues. We went back into our archives, in the cases that we were familiar with here in Raleigh. And what Detective Morgan finds sends him in a new direction entirely. We found two cases where the police department had investigated suicides by arsenic poisoning. Family man Eric Miller seems like the last person who would commit suicide, but Detective Morgan can't rule anything out. One of the things that I learned long, long ago because things aren't always as they appear. Some people who appear on the surface have a perfect life. I mean, when you dig beneath the surface, they're not happy, they're not well adjusted. But why would Eric take such a drastic step? In the research triangle, you get a lot of people who are in competition with lots of other people. And we had to look very thoroughly at internal and external stresses in Eric's employment. But the further investigators look into Eric's background, the less plausible the suicide theory seems. We evaluated everything that we had uncovered, everything that we had examined about his life. There was just nothing there that indicated suicide. The deeper you look, cleaner air it gets. If this wasn't suicide, and it wasn't an accident, only one explanation remains. That leaves you with intentional homicidal poisoning. There was evil intent that led to Eric Miller's death. Well, even in this wholesome hamlet, who hasn't harbored a wicked wish or two? But murder? You don't hear about people being poisoned much these days, do you? I know, right? There's a few people whose drink I like to spike, though. You think one of Eric's friends had it in for him? Maybe. Doesn't take much these days. Such shocking statements from such good citizens. Perhaps that's why investigators begin their search for suspects close to home. Poisoning can't be done from across the street or from behind a bush out in the parking area. It has to be done by somebody who is up close and personal. And who was closer to Eric than his grieving wife, Anne? But for Tom Boylan, the idea that Anne could be involved is unthinkable. To say that they were the perfect couple would be an understatement. With a rock-solid marriage and a blissful home, Anne is an unlikely suspect. So Detective Morgan decides to turn his attention back to the murder weapon, arsenic. We're a bunch of cops. Most of us never took chemistry, let alone passed it. Fortunately, Ruth Whitaker passed with flying colors. This chief toxicologist knows that figuring out when the arsenic entered Eric's system will be crucial to finding his killer. The poisoning the timeline uh, can be very important. You might be able to pinpoint um, when someone had access to a certain individual and they possibly could have gotten a dose of the poison. Will this timeline actually help them catch a killer? His early symptoms are consistent with an arsenic poisoning, the flu-like symptoms. But arsenic doesn't waste time on the niceties. The effects of arsenic poisoning are usually seen between 30 minutes and two hours after exposure. So who was Eric with right before the onset of these early warning signs? We knew that Eric had left work at UNC and appeared to be healthy and fine. And he went to the bowling alley, gets a hot dog. One of the fellas pours him a beer and serves it to him. An hour later, 
He's sitting over there with a, you know, his head in a bag because he's so sick. Now, who doesn't get a little queasy from time to time after a night out of the bowling alley? But as his neighbors, the Mayos, know, binge boozing isn't Eric's style. He's always looking good health. He was a runner. He used to go running with his friend down the street. Could Eric's frosty beverage have contained a secret and deadly ingredient? We went to the bowling alley looking for witness, somebody who had seen something that was unusual, and also looking for some sort of evidence. What he finds gives the investigation a major shot in the arm. There were Eric and three other guys that went bowling that night, research scientists who were co-workers of Ann. Two out of the three of them were very forthcoming. I mean, they were willing to help with the investigation. But that still leaves bowler number three and Miller's office mate, Daryl Willard. Daryl was difficult to locate. Essentially didn't return phone calls and requests to come in and be interviewed. And this is something that seemed kind of suspicious. And that's not all. Daryl turned out to be the individual who had actually purchased the pitcher of beer and poured the beer for his fellow bowlers. Curious neighbors are delighted to hear the detectives have an elusive suspect in their sights. I mean, if you didn't do it, why doesn't you just go to the cops? I know, right? I mean, these guys were just bowling buddies. They're not international spies. Could be money, could be drugs. I mean, if they start digging around, they're going to find something was going on. We'll see. Oh, gentlemen, how right you are. The most startling revelation about Daryl is still to come. Further investigation reveals that this unholy roller is more than just Ann Miller's office buddy. Emails from Ann's computer at work showed clearly that she was involved in a romantic relationship with Daryl Willard. Looks like there were more than just chemical reactions brewing in this lab. Have investigators just stumbled upon the oldest motive for murder? Every scientist worth his sodium chloride knows that work and play don't mix. And when it happens in a lab, the combination can be deadly. Just ask Eric Miller's bowling buddy and Ann Miller's bed buddy, Daryl Willard. I think the more we found out about the nature of this relationship with Ann, the puzzle that started coming together. And talk of a love triangle gone bad is spilling over into Raleigh's finest cafes. Well, you know, lust is a strong, powerful thing. It'll make people do a lot of evil things. Arsenic. Where in the world does arsenic come from? A lot of people used to use it in farming to kill rats, but I doubt people use it much anymore. Naughty Daryl, where did you get that deadly arsenic? Police have an idea. They race to Daryl's lab and make a shocking find. All the arsenic a literary killer could desire. We discovered that arsenic was what they used to cleanse and purify the petri dishes they're trying to grow these protein crystals in. But there's no way to tie it to Eric Miller. There was no way to match conclusively the arsenic that was in Eric's blood and urine at the time of his death with the arsenic in that lab. Arsenic's arsenic. That may be true. Still, you don't have to be a mystery writer to see this story coming together. Well, the arsenic in the fair certainly gives him motive and opportunity. And the bowling gives him the time that he could have done it. It's a classic case. While the scribblers find inspiration for their latest novels, investigators light a fire under research scientist Daryl Willard. Daryl didn't want to be interviewed. Daryl didn't want to be talked to. Not one for small talk, the less than social scientist has a surefire way to avoid talking to police. Next afternoon, I was sitting in my office, and then we get a call from the sheriff's department. Morgan was saying, you know, the guy you interviewed, he's dead in this garage. Daryl Willard has committed suicide, leaving behind a wife, a young daughter, and a handwritten glimpse into his tortured soul. We learned the contents of a suicide note that he had left. But if investigators are hoping for a confession, they're in for a major disappointment. He says, 
I've taken no life other than my own. It's another devastating setback. It was what we all viewed as our best chance for success in this case. It was just no longer there. With yet another Triangle resident in the grave, connecting the dots is proving difficult, especially for Eric's friends and family. I was frustrated, and the other people who knew Eric were very frustrated. Okay. But Detective Morgan isn't giving up. Neither is toxicologist Ruth Winokur. When there's a poisoning, it's important to collect all the specimens you can. The hair, in particular, is useful because it can establish a timeline. And when the results of the testing on Eric's hair come in, they reveal a stunning twist. So clinically, he looks like he's gotten arsenic, and then he's getting better, OK? And then it looks like he's getting arsenic again. Apparently, Eric's poisoner was nothing if not conscientious. Which follows his clinical history of he started feeling a little bit better even while he was in the hospital. And then all of a sudden, he bottoms out. And the timing of this final dose is truly shocking. There's a very good likelihood that he received additional arsenic while he's actually being treated in the hospital. Yes, that's very likely. It's a chilling possibility. Eric's killer may have paid a deadly visit to his hospital bedside. And if so, there's one frequent visitor who can't be ignored. So who's there? The only person that's consistently always there is Anne. Anne Miller, loving wife, scientist, murderer? That's the word circling around the triangle these days. Who has better access to her husband than his wife? Or better motive, for that matter? Well, she is a scientist, so she knows her way around the lab. Either that, or she's a really bad cook. Did this wayward wife and her secret lover cook up more than just a bit of kinky chemistry? Nobody gets away with murder in my town. Research Triangle is all at Twitter over the news that sultry scientist Ann Miller is the leading suspect in her husband's murder. And many still doubt that this homegrown hottie is capable of cold-blooded murder. She's so cute put together. You really think she could do something so evil? I heard she was messing around. She probably just wanted to get him out of the picture. But seriously, poison? Yeah, I think she'd watched one too many soap operas. Totally. But just as investigators are about to give up hope, Detective Morgan gets a lead from a most unlikely source. Daryl Willard's wife told us that Daryl had talked about his meeting with his lawyer. Daryl's wife believes that her husband may have shared one final secret with his lawyer before taking his own life. I knew that Daryl Willard knew who killed Eric have told his lawyer enough so the lawyer knew now. But there's one major hurdle, attorney-client privilege. We eventually end up petitioning the county superior court, and then it gets kicked up to the Supreme Court of North Carolina to get the information that we need. After two long years of litigation, the court orders that Daryl's secret finally be revealed. Daryl Willard told his lawyer that Anne Miller, she had injected the poison into an IV that Eric was hooked up to. But investigators now know that was just one of many doses Eric received. And it all started that night at the bowling alley. What we surmised is that Ann had conspired with Daryl to deliver the poison. But the arsenic Daryl put in Eric's beer didn't quite do the trick. Daryl was being used as a tool by Ann. And unfortunately for her, not a very effective tool. If you want a job done right, sometimes you just have to do it yourself. If he had died that night, Ann would have never had to have been involved in giving Eric the poisoning that killed him. I think she played him like a fiddle. She knew what she wanted and knew how to get it. Why wouldn't she just hire a divorce lawyer? I guess arsenic's a lot cheaper. But why would Anne risk everything to kill her perfect husband? The motive is surprisingly simple. Anne was tired of being married. She was tired of being 
Eric Miller's wife. She wanted to be on her own. Come now, surely there are better ways to get unhitched? Divorce would have been no problem, but the point was, how was she going to explain I divorced everybody's Mr. Nice Guy? I believe deep down in my soul and will always believe that Anna's psychopath. Perhaps, but this toxic killer is finally ready to come clean. Anne confessed in Superior Court that she killed her husband and she conspired with Daryl Willard to attempt to kill her husband. Anne pleads guilty and is sentenced to 25 to 31 years in prison. For Lynette and Michael Mayo, Anne's arrest is just the latest in a string of tragic and unforgettable events. Up to the very end, I thought Anne was innocent. You know, she seemed to love Eric, and her, his folks really cared for her. You know, but it, it, when she pleaded guilty, that's when I said, okay, this is it. I had to give up. You know, she's guilty. Now as the good people of Raleigh pursue their own dreams, they're forced to confront Eric's worst nightmare. Well, it's frightening that there are people out there like that. Um, and at first love, it's frightening that I, that I knew her, or I thought I knew her. They say love is blind, and sometimes those who love unwisely are the last to realize the coldest truth. Eric Miller went to his grave, blind to the darkness in his wife's heart. And perhaps this was his final blessing.